This is Marvin Delaney. I'm a retired uh, history professor from the University of Texas at Arlington. Currently, I am the deputy director and chief operations officer at the Dallas African American Museum in Fair Park. I came to Dallas about 40 years ago now. And when I came, of course, I was interested in looking at local history and specifically looking at the civil rights movement in Dallas, Texas. I was studying the history of uh, African-Americans and policing. So that sort of led me to look at what had happened in Dallas. And lo and behold, I found that, of course, that integrating the police in Dallas was also tied to uh, the civil rights movement. That is uh, addressing issues such as housing, voting, education, and employment for African-Americans in the city of Dallas. Um, I have titled this, of course, as you see, the civil rights movement in Dallas, but I've subtitled it the long movement because our we historians have sort of decided that the, the civil rights movement, well, we didn't sort of decide, we have decided that the civil rights movement didn't start in 1954 with the Brown decision or with the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott started by Rosa Parks. So let me start. Um, when I first came here, you know, there were some myths that were out there about the, the Dallas Civil Rights Movement. Uh, as you see on the screen, um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. One, that there was no Civil Rights Movement in Dallas, and two, uh, Texas was uh, this Western state uh, more associated with cattle ranching and cowboys than with, of course, Southern segregation. Of course, again, these are myths, as you can see on the screen. Going forward, you see what the facts were that Dallas was as segregated as any other city in the South, and it was segregated in all aspects of life uh, for African Americans. And, and again, you see the areas of housing, employment, education, and criminal justice. Uh, I'm going to go forward. Um, of course, note the point that Dallas was a hotbed for the Ku Klux Klan. It had more Klan members than any other city in the South. Uh, this, of course, is a national map showing the power of the Klan in the 1920s. But I want to point you also to uh, the image of Alexander Johnson down in the right-hand corner. He indeed was a victim of Klan violence. He was taken out and whipped in 1921 because as a clerk at the Adolphus Hotel in downtown Dallas, he had bragged about having relationships with white women. So Klan members, of course, kidnapped him, whipped him, and as you see, branded his forehead with uh, the letters KKK. Going forward, uh, I want to just show you and, and illustrate how da Dallas was segregated. This was, of course, published by the Lone Star Restaurant Association, showing how the restaurants discriminated, discriminated against Negroes, Mexicans, and, of course, dogs. Here's another one. This, of course, is from 1949, showing um, a, an amusement, basically, at the, uh, the Texas State Fair. Uh, again, lynching was uh, sort of a, a a mess throughout the country in, in the early late 19th and early 20th centuries. And you see Texas was number three uh, in lynching. And of course, there was one that even occurred here in Dallas in, in 1910. And of course, this, uh, Alan Brooks was lynched for allegedly uh, molesting a young white child. Uh, these show you, this is a list of how African Americans were disfranchised, not only in Dallas, but throughout the, the state of Texas. Texas became known for the, its white primary. That is a law that said that African Americans could not participate in the primaries of the Democratic Party. And of course, that's sort of ironic today, given that, that African Americans are 90% uh, uh, members of the Democratic Party. Anyway, going forward, we see that the battle against the white primary started in the 1920s by a doctor out of El Paso, Dr. Lawrence A. Nixon, and of course he filed and won two lawsuits against the Democratic Party's white primary. So what I'm going to do then is sort of focus on two areas in, in this short presentation. I want to focus on the struggle for voting rights and at the end, education. Of course, I, I focus on voting rights because voting rights affect everything else. They affect it if the voting rights affect housing, education, 
in employment, uh, and, and basically all aspects of life for uh, American citizens. So here in Dallas, or and in Texas in general, uh, Lawrence Nixon was sort of a pioneer in filing these cases in the late, 920, late 1920s and the early 1930s. Uh, these two individuals are, are important in the movement, in terms of the movement here in Dallas, because they sort of led it. They were sort of the instigators. Uh, a. Maceo Smith was from Texarkana. He came to Dallas in 1934 after getting his education at Fisk College and New York University. Uh, Maynard Jackson is a native of Dallas. He went to Dallas Colored High School, then went to Morehouse, and then came back and became the pastor of New Hope Baptist Church in 1935. Anyway, these two are, are, are sort of the leaders of the movement that begins in the 1930s. You heard me mention earlier that the civil rights movement is a long movement, and it didn't start in 1954, 1955. Well, as you see, these, as, as, as I'm going to show, these two men started their leadership of the movement here in Dallas in the 1930s. Um, here, for example, I'm, I'm showing you some poll tax receipts. Starting in the 1930s, Smith and Jackson started what they called poll tax payment campaigns to encourage African Americans to pay that poll tax between December 1st and February 1st so that they could vote in local elections. So again, remember, they're, they're blocked from the Democratic primary, primarily because of, the, of, of this white primary that existed from the beginning of the, of the 20th century, but they could vote in local elections. And so they start these campaigns then to encourage African Americans to vote in the local elect elections by paying their poll tax. A, a key event happens in 1935. As you see, Judge Sarah T. Hughes, which, who becomes the first woman federal judge in the city of, in the state of Texas, resigns and it opens up her seat in the state legislature. As a result, Amon S. Wells, an attorney here in Dallas, who was also one of the founders of the Dallas NAACP, that is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, in 1917, uh, decided to run for office. His decision sparks a lot of activity, uh, a, a lot of resistance from the Ku Klux Klan and, the, and Dallas's white community. In fact, members of the state legislature said that if he ran, he would not be seated. And of course, he had a chance to win because 60 people uh, registered and ran in this local general election. And he, he finished six in spite of this threat that you see that uh, the, the Klan issues in March th uh, 1935, he finished sixth in the election. And so indeed, he, he sort of opened up the idea to African Americans that if they voted, they could change things. And so as you see, this article in the Atlanta Daily World sort of uh, documents what happened in, in 1935, and it encourages A. Maceo Smith and Maynard Jackson to, to do even more in terms of encouraging African Americans to pay their poll tax. Of course, Texas celebrated its continuum in 1936, and African Americans participated in it, and the federal government built the Hall of Negro Life. Now, this building sort of symbolizes what happened in 1936. That is, African Americans from all across the state came to, to Dallas to, of course, celebrate the centennial, to go to the Hall of Negro Life. But they also had meetings to discuss how, how they could win their voting rights and win their civil rights in the state of Texas. Out of the centennial grew the Texas state branches of the, of the NAACP, the Texas Negro Peace Officers Association, and a statewide organization of, of, the, of the Negro Chamber of Commerce. Anyway, it sort of redoubled the efforts of African Americans to, to win their civil rights in education, in voting, and in housing. It, it encouraged A. Macy L. Smith and Maynard Jackson, who were sitting in the first row of this picture, to create the Progressive Voters League. It, it also would become a statewide organization. And of course, the main thing that they wanted to do was overturn the white primary and, of course, open up Texas so that African Americans would have the same rights as, as, as whites. Locally, they participated in a local voting rights, excuse me, poll tax payment drive in which they were able to get 10,000 African Americans in the city of Dallas to pay the poll tax and register to vote. This had an impact on the local city council election of 1937. 
That is, the Voters League was able to influence that election and African Americans were able to elect a local nonpartisan group called the Ford Dallas Association over the Citizens Charter Association. And of course, they made several demands. As you see, the demands included a new high school, a new housing project, and more jobs for African Americans in the city. And of course, black police officers. As you see on this image, they did not get the police officers in 1937 as a result of their votes, but they did get the other three. Now, one of the uh, one of the restrictions that African Americans faced was on serving on juries. So, in September of 1938, George Porter, who was a teacher at Booker T. Washington High School and the secretary of the NAACP decided to try and serve on a jury. He was attacked by three white men, thrown out of the courthouse, and of course injured. The state and local authorities did nothing about this assault on George Porter. So this brings a uh, Thurgood Marshall to Dallas for the first time. And this is sort of fortuitous because Thurgood Marshall is going to be in and out of Dallas repeatedly pursuing civil rights cases. You see some of the cases that he, he won before the Supreme Court. But in, in this particular case, he got the federal government to uh, pr uh, prosecute the three white men who had thrown George Porter out of the courthouse in downtown Dallas. And this success, that is, to, today we, we don't think anything about how people should be prosecuted when they you know, assault someone. But in 1938, this was a major achievement that Marshall actually got three white men prosecuted and they served four years in Leavenworth prison. This also helps the NAACP. That is, as a result of this case, it showed that the NAACP could, could get results. And it helps people like Juanita Kraft to begin to recruit more members for, of the NAACP here in Dallas. The Dallas NAACP became the second largest branch in the state of Texas, but behind Houston. And as you see, she, she herself becomes the head of the NAACP Youth Council, and she indeed would lead the Youth Council in uh, picketing the State Fair of Texas to end what was called Negro Achievement Day, to end discrimination at some of the theaters and public places in downtown. And of course, as you see, she goes on to serve on the, on, uh, on the City Council of, of Dallas. In 1944, uh, Maynard Jackson decided to take another step. He becomes the second African American to try to win a local elective office. He loses, and he loses because the NAACP had been prosecuting and pursuing ending the white primary. They finally win a case, the Smith versus Allwright case in 1944, which allows African Americans then to pursue and participate in the Democratic Party's primaries. And so it sort of changes the, the South. Uh, this is a landmark case, and let me just sort of emphasize, as a result of this case that um, Marshall and the local attorneys won in uh, Dallas, it strikes down the white primary in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, and, and in fact, it begins to strike down the white primaries all across the South, and which it then allows African Americans to participate in the Democratic Party's uh, politics. Now, Dallas was also part of the, the national civil rights movement. And of course, the person who sort of sets the sort of the policies and the direction of the national civil rights movement in the South, particularly in terms of education, was um, uh, the general counsel, Charles Hamilton Houston. Houston in the 1930s developed what he called the three-pronged strategy to attack segregated education in the South. You see the three here in providing transportation for, for black students, mainly because in many counties in the South, there was only one high school and sometimes African-American students would have to travel 50, 60 miles to get to that high school. And so what, what Houston wanted to do was force those local school districts to provide 
buses to African-American students. You see, they, he wanted to equalize the salaries. I'm going to show in a minute what that meant in Dallas. And then, of course, he wanted African-Americans to have access to graduate and professional schools so that in all these segregated school systems in the South, there were no graduate schools where African-Americans could earn, for example, professional degrees, degrees in pharmacy, and in law, and in medicine. So uh, three local attorneys worked with Marshall in pursuing some of these cases. One of the cases that they won was the, the case of Thelma Page Richardson, who in 1942 won a case to equalize the salaries of black teachers with white teachers in the city of Dallas' school district. She well, uh, was educated herself at the university. In fact, she had a, a master's degree from the University of Denver, but in spite of her having an advanced degree, she, as you see in 1940, made some $500 less than the white teachers. She wins that case in, in 1942 in a case called, called as you saw before, uh, a, a case called Page versus the City of Dallas Board of Education. Anyway, going forward, Dallas, of course, had a segregated school system and it had segregationist judges uh, in, in the federal courts in the city who basically did not want to follow the Brown decision of 1954. And so they used all kinds of subterfuges. They, they came up with uh, desegregation plans called the Salt and Pepper Plan and, and the Legacy Plan. A uh, Salt and Pepper Plan meant that before a black student could go to a white school, a white student had to agree to go to a black school. In the, in the legacy plan, before a black student could go to a white school, a, he or she had to have had a sibling who had went to a white school. And as you see, uh, all these were subterfuges to delay desegregation of the public schools in, in, in Dallas. Finally, they came up with the, the stair-step plan uh, that they actually implemented in 1961. And of course, this was a plan where they would desegregate the first grade, those students then who went desegregated the first grade would go to the second grade. And again, they would do this on a year by year basis so that it would actually have taken 12 years to desegregate the, the city's public schools. They actually began the process in 1961. And as you see here, um, no violence occurred. That is, Dallas was unlike Little Rock in New Orleans where, you know, there was violent white opposition to African-American children going to the city's public schools with white students. And by the way, they finally came up with uh, this plan and they prepared the, the city for it by coming up with a film and a little pamphlet called Dallas at the Crossroads, in which they were encouraging white parents not to come out into the streets spitting and hollering and screaming at black children who were trying to desegregate the city's public schools. So this has just been a little quickie um, presentation on the civil rights movement in Dallas. As you see, it was a long movement, started in the 1930s, carried all the way into the 1960s. And of course, some would argue we're, we're still struggling to, to desegregate the city of Dallas. Uh, the schools, for example, now have become 60% Hispanic about 20% African-American. So they're in, indeed, we're back to what we started with in the, in the 1950s. So thank you. This has been Marvin Delaney um, sharing with you uh, my analysis and perspective on the civil rights movement in Dallas, Texas. Thank you.